proclaim his cross to the world. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready, make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 17 and verses 22 through 25. Oh, what a good passage. I, put your hands together for that incredible, famous, what y'all seem like you got a, like a Thanksgiving turkey hangover today. What's up, First Baptist Church, 1130 edition. There you go. If you are here for the first time, wow, thank you so much. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here at First Baptist Church, and we're honored you're with us. I know it's a busy time of year, a lot of travel. Uh, we got people are normally here and not here this weekend, but some of y'all brought your guests. Last service, I met people from other countries who came on vacation to church. I love that. And so we're glad you're here. If you travel, thanks for being here. That passage, that passage that the team read so wonderfully well, that same story shows up in multiple places in your Bible. It's so important. Of course, it's a story of what you might call communion or the Lord's Supper, and we're going to participate in that today. We're going to celebrate that today. Uh, but I love that we get multiple descriptions of what Jesus did and what Jesus said. We never know his motivation. We, we don't know his thought process. Uh, we don't know what he was thinking. What was he thinking? What was he thinking? Everybody in the room, if you do life with someone, you ask that question, don't you? Come on, wives. Come on, where are my wives? Where are my wives. That man has done so many things over the years. Been married more than two weeks, right? You said, what is he thinking? What is, what is he thinking? Like, I don't know. Like, maybe he's thinking about giving you a really nice fly rod for your anniversary because some friends recommended that to him. And, yes, it was the 25th anniversary and he almost, he didn't do it because he thought, that's really dumb. And she'll think, what is he thinking? I didn't do that. It's a hypothetical. I just brought that out. Hypothetical. Uh, you have teenagers. Where are my parents? Make some noise. Parents, parents. Oh, we got teenagers all the time. You say, man, what is that boy thinking? What is she thinking? It's just part of human nature. So I like when we have a famous story about Jesus in the Bible. I like to think about what he was thinking about. I like to think about what he was thinking about, and I think I can surmise what he's thinking about. So I want to speculate a little bit as we dive deeply into this passage. What was Jesus thinking about? Now, I hope you brought your Bible. If you did, where do we go? This is recorded throughout the Gospels. Let's go surprisingly not to a Gospel, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll be there in just a moment. But what was he thinking? Context. Context. When I say three, shout the word context. One, two, three. Context. So the whole Bible is inspired. But some verses you can't pluck out of context, right? They have a context that matters. So we give you the historical context of what we know as the Lord's Supper or communion. By the way, Jesus never gave it a name. So it's even diverse in what we call this thing. Uh, but it is the Passover Seder. As we read what happened just before, and you probably know what happened right after, this is Jesus reinterpreting already a special and sacred meal for the Israelis in the first century, the Seder. Now, now Jesus had a three-year ministry with the disciples. And Jesus was a good Jewish boy. I mean, he grew up in a good Jewish family. In fact, uh, for Christmas here in a few weeks, by the way, I just pushed the pause button on, my, on myself. December is going to be loaded here at church. I, I'm just saying. So O.S. Hawkins in the house, 
Now, some of y'all don't know us. He was a pastor here. Uh, gosh, when they built the giant building, he's one of those iconic leaders I've ever met in my life. I love O.S. Hawkins. He's very strong. He's visionary, a great, great preacher, a dear friend. If you've never heard Dr. Hawkins, just strap it on and get ready for next week. I'm telling you, you will love him. Dynamic communicator. So that's on the 3rd. Then the next Sunday after that, I think that's the 10th, Anthony Evans right here at 1130 in a mini Christmas concert. You know, Anthony has a great voice, one of the best worship leaders on the planet. And uh, he'll do like a, a short concert. I'll do it. Short sermon, yes, I can do, actually a short sermon, and so I'll be here as well, so that, that's in two weeks. Then after that, what we are calling the First Baptist Christmas Experience. This church has a great tradition over the decades of an amazing Christmas presentation, had this epic you know, pageant with flying camels and angels and everything else going on. Uh, it won't quite be that because this room doesn't facilitate all of that, but if y'all know Church by the Glades, yeah, we do a little creativity ourselves. And so it's not going to be your normal service. It won't be the pageant, but pretend like the two had a baby. So it's going to be fun and creative and immersive and surprising. It's a great time to invite people to church. Three people clapping. Let me miss the rest of y'all. Stop. Too late. No, no, no pity applause. So listen, people need Jesus just as much in August. But they're often not receptive. But around Christmas time, and especially if you live downtown, there is a history and tradition of this church providing an amazing Christmas experience. Let's leverage that. So people are receptive. People that might shoot you down in July or February will probably say yes this time of year. So grab those invite cards and pray a dangerous. In fact, I have everything. I got Christmas. I got generic First Baptist. I got Church by the Glaze. I'm out. Well, I got it covered here, right? This is the full house of invite. Keep that on your person. And just pray that God will give you an opportunity to invite someone and watch what God does. So that's on, I think, the 17th. And then uh, actually Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. So during the 10 o'clock at 1130, we're going to do a candlelight service here. So it's going to be awesome in December. So, man, make sure you block out those Sundays and make sure you start praying right now for who you're going to invite to be with you for December. Oh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Passover, Passover. So Jesus being a, a good Jew, by the way, I, I'm going to talk about Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to talk about what kind of happens after Christmas, and we get part of that, we find out that Jesus' family was, was steeped in Jewish ritual and routine, like we find out he was dedicated at eight days old, that's also in Luke chapter 2, that's where the Christmas story is, we find out when he was 12, they went to the temple, a, a multiple day journey for the high holy days, so Jesus grew up with all the beautiful tradition of his faith, now, this is three-year ministry. His ministry, this is three years into it. So we can assume because he's a good Jewish boy from a good Jewish family, he has celebrated the Passover the two times before with his disciples. But the Bible tells us nothing about that. We get no details. So we can assume he probably did nothing all that innovative or that surprising or we'd have a record of it. But this third time, this third time he changes things up dramatically. He puts a new layer of beautiful symbolism on the already symbolic Passover meal. And it's phenomenal. So why, why, what was he thinking? I think he knew that the cross was right around the corner. The chronology in the Bible this third time is literally his hours before he's arrested. So it goes, the Lord's Supper, they leave and go to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays, he sweats drops of blood. And then in the garden, his betrayer shows up and he is arrested He's condemned, and within just hours, he's crucified. Jesus knows the Lord's Supper is in the shadow of the cross, and everything, everything, everything he does is pointing to the cross. The disciples, duh, they don't get it. They're still thinking he's going to be an earthly king, and there'll be his 12 lieutenants, right? They'll have all kinds of power and glory. He's saying, no, my father has a different plan. So it's just before the cross. What's the takeaway for us? The closer we get to the cross, the clearer we understand Jesus. He's unpacking all this truth, all this revelation, man. He's, he's firing all this stuff. They don't process it. We understand the closer you get to the cross, the more the king makes sense. So this is just hours before the cross. Now, why, why, what was he thinking? Say it with me. What was he thinking? Saying, what was he thinking? What was Jesus thinking? We don't know. So why all this conversation about his body and the blood? Why, why? Okay, here, here's why I think. I think he knew his audience. Good communicators got to know their audience. 
I preached to some churches before. The vibe's like really mellow. Like somebody really involved, nods and takes notes carefully. The vibe's like, shh, you got to know your audience. I prefer the, a rowdy church. I like a rowdy. I, I just say I, I like engagement. I think feedback is fun. I prefer dialogues to monologues. Amen? Amen? So we encourage you all to kind of respond a little bit. I just think it's more engaging and more intriguing. But you got to know your audience. Jesus knew his audience. No, the record was made for us through Scripture. The original audience was the twelve. And uh, you might look at the 12 disciples as kind of a, a monolithic crew. And I would see, yeah, I guess they're all men about the same age. They're younger men. They're all Israeli. They all come from the same region, Galilee. But guess what? They were as different as different can be. Personalities. Oh, my God. Those disciples were so different, and Jesus knew that. Think about the disciples' personality. Jesus' nicknames. I love me a good nickname. He nicknamed James and John in, in Aramaic, Boanerges. Boanerges. What's that mean, David? Sons of Thunder. That's a good nickname, right? What can we surmise if your nicknames are Sons of Thunder? You're loud, right? You're, you're boisterous. You're opinionated. You're ambitious. Remember their mom asked, could they sit on both the right and the left side of Jesus in his kingdom someday? That's the sons of thunder. They're loud. Peter, louder, right? I love Peter. He's reckless. He's impulsive. He's charismatic. He's a natural leader. I love Peter. One of those people talks first, thinks later. Anybody, anybody? Anybody, come on, I do that. You'll go lying in church. I do something like talk, and maybe I shouldn't have said that. That's Peter. I love Peter. Loves Jesus. By contrast, Thomas, pensive, thoughtful, skeptical, asks hard questions. Right? You got all kinds of different personalities, different dispositions among just the 12. I told you all about six weeks ago, uh, he had Matthew in the room at the table, Matthew. Then there's a second Simon. Of course, Simon is Peter. That's a famous Simon. But there's another Simon. We get nothing about him. We don't know his whole name. Like it doesn't say, and then Simon Jones or Simon Berkowitz, right, Jewish boy. Uh, it just says Simon the Zealot. All we know about this Simon was he was a zealot. But let me tell you what a zealot was. A zealot was a member of a spiritual political party in the first century. Uh, they had Pharisees and Sadducees. They show up in the Bible. They had a group called the Essenes. But then who were the zealots? The zealots were the patriots, freedom fighters. They despised the oppressive Romans. And they would use even violence trying to liberate their people. So a zealot would take his dagger in a dark alley to the ribs of a Roman soldier any chance. They hated the Romans. And the only people that the zealots hated worse than a Roman was a Jew who was complicit with the Romans. Like, I don't know, a tax collector like Matthew. So Simon the zealot and Matthew the tax collector in the same room by themselves would try to kill each other. That's why the Prince of Peace invades this circumstance. I think he's trying to build unity, unity in the 12. Because knowing their differences left alone, they would fragnate, they'd, they'd be disunified, they'd be divisive. Guess what? The enemy's been using division to stop the work of God, to hurt his people from the word of God. Man, it happens all the time. There are churches across America. They get all political and divisive and polarized, and the enemy just laughs. Jesus was trying to bring unity. When I say three, shout the word unity. One, two, three. Unity. Biblical, needful. So how? Well, he could try to get all of the 12 disciples uh, to line up on all the issues. Let's just see if we can get alignment. We'll just talk about all these different of opinions and preferences. And we'll just try to get all 12 of you guys. Good luck with that. How's that work in your family? You got more than one person in your family, right? You have these differences. You feel it. So that's not the way that good leaders build unity. What good leaders do is they, they don't focus on all those small, divisive, petty person. They focus on something big, something big. And so Jesus, everything in the Last Supper is drawing attention to the cross. It's the big thing I'm about to do for you knuckleheads, he says. I'm going to go to the cross and unselfishly die for your sins and the sins of the world. That's big. Because we all have preferences. We all have preferences. 
We all, raise your hand if you have preferences. Raise your hand if you have preferences, opinions. Raise your hand. If you all didn't, raise your hand. See, your preference was not to raise your hand. That, I respect that, right? It, it's human. It's, not, it's, right. it's normal to have taste and preferences and opinions. I have preference. I have opinion. Sometimes my opinions aren't even based on fact. I just have opinions, right? Yeah. And so we all have preferences that makes us human. And in church, with this beautiful diversity that we have, there's no way we're going to feel the same about everything. Amen? Amen? Oh, let me give you an example. Who here loves, I was in Texas last week. When I'm in Texas, here's my, here's my dietary rotation. Big steak, barbecue, Tex-Mex. I love Mexican food. If you love Mexican food, if it's amazing, make some noise right now. Make some, oh, it's one of my favorites. Favorite chicken enchiladas, fajitas. Chips and salsa. Who on the other hand would say, look, look, ne- Mexican's not my bag. I don't like it. A little too spicy. Anybody? 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 Thank you. We don't judge my brother. That's awesome. That, that's, that's great. That's great. Uh, Cuban food. Who likes Cuban food? Who likes Cuban food? Who doesn't care for Cuban food? Anybody don't care for Cuban food? Right, right. Who loves the Dolphins? Who loves the Dolphins? Who loves, I don't know, the New York Jets? The Jets. Okay, pray for these people. Pray for these people right here. They may not be saved. We'll pray. No, just kidding. It's, those are all preferences. They really don't matter. But as the church of Jesus Christ, well, there's a bunch of us trying to align all our preferences will never work. To be unified, we must focus on something that's big. See, the closer we get to the cross, the more we focus on the cross, the more we understand Jesus, the more we focus on Jesus, I got a mission. Peter, I know you're loud and you're impulsive. And Thomas, I know you're careful. And, and Simon the Zealot, I know you don't like Matthew because of his background, but he's changed. He's changed. The cross. Everything points to the cross. Points to the cross. So I'm a pastor. And by the way, the way I like to lead, I like to take feedback. I, I like to, whenever possible, to meet people at the point of their preferences. We all have that, right? We ever try to keep 700 people happy? Like out west, so we're trying to keep 7,000 people happy. Well, that's, that's a tough task. So, here's my goal as a leader if I can spend my day pleasing the Lord, if I can please Jesus and Lisa Hughes, that's a good day right there. Anybody else I happen to please, that's just that's bonus. But we do receive feedback, we walk in that, uh, it, it's helpful. Uh, sometimes it can be challenging. So, as we've stepped in here, I've now been the pastor here for five and a half. Uh, five and a half months, and some of y'all have been here the whole time. Thank you. Some of you guys are here decades before me. And I want to say this, the people I've stepped into, about 200 strong, a little more, have been phenomenal. They have been so great and so awesome and so spiritual and so right-hearted. They have been an absolute joy, but we all have preferences. So we renovated this room, been here like, like four weeks now, and I think the team did a great job. This room feels amazing. The technologies are great. It's a really cool venue for what we do. Well, so the other service, t- who's been to the 10 o'clock? Anybody been to the 10 o'clock? Okay, it's a good service too. Uh, a little lower volume, you know, a little more mellow. The uh, music's more vocally driven, the band driven, but it's really good, good service. In a different room, event center, it's, it's upstairs, it's like windows and stuff. Well, when we got this ready, some of the folks from 10 o'clock asked me, could we move both services to this room? I don't have a preference. Now, if it's a big kingdom issue, I have a preference. But it's about the cross or G. I, but guess what? That's an issue of taste. So I actually, you know, emailed some of the, the, the deacon leaders and committee leaders from back in the day. People, good people, in around, and asked if they would meet me just quickly after the ten o'clock service in a side room, very informal, not going to vote. I said, "Hey, someone suggested taking both services to the new room. What do y'all think?" Right down the middle. Everyone was nice. They were polite. No one got angry. But I'm telling, it may not have been a fifty-fifty, but uh, I don't know. A, 55, 45, I mean, it was, there was definitely not a consensus. And then that same day, I went to lunch, and we have a sweet lady named Sandy. Sandy is 93 years young, sharp as a tack. Some of y'all know Sandy. She's one of the, the, the heroes of this church for decades. She's super respected. And Sandy's at lunch, and she heard about this meeting. She missed it. David, what, what did you ask her to do the question? I said, well, do we move the 10 o'clock over here? And I didn't even finish that statement. Sandy said, No. No, I like it where it is. It's a better spot. It's better for community. She had good reason. She's smart, sharp, and she's so respected. She's so respected. I thought, well, I, I can't disagree with Sandy. She's like the Holy Spirit. I can't do that. <laughs> and then Betty Grant. Anybody met Betty Grant yet? Betty, all right, yeah. Man, she, she, if Betty promises to pray for you. You're being prayed for. I love Betty. She's also 
super respect around here. Well, Betty texts me the next day and said, Pastor, I talked to some of the women. We want to go to the new room. <laughs> what do you do? You know, listen, thank you for being mature. Thank you for recognizing we don't always get our preferences. Last service, someone caught me and said, hey, the music's kind of loud. Someone else caught me and said, it's kind of quiet. <laughs> We're human. I never want to spiritualize my preference. You know, my taste in music or worship style or the vibe. In fact, very important, too, is we have two different styles. Like, like we can't tell the other group, and y'all are stuck like in 1955. Wake up, join the, no, and, and they can't say, y'all are too loud, too crazy. As long as Jesus and the cross are preached and he is worshiped, we're doing church. I think Jesus knew with all these different personalities in the 12, he had to give them a reason to stay unified because the enemy loves to work through division, through division. So brilliant, he gives us, and by the way, as I, as I talk about the Lord's Supper, and maybe you grew up in church like me where we had the Lord's Supper occasionally. It was kind of like a little thing we tagged on the end of the service. I'm taking more time to explain than I normally would, but the reason is diversity. I love our churches diverse. If you look around the room right now, you see what? You see different cultures and different races, and you see different generations. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. I think the church should be biblically diverse. It gets us ready for heaven. But also, we're theologically diverse because even the people here who come from a Christian background, that's not everybody. But you come from different churches, different sizes, different vibes, different denominations, and different churches and different Christians have their own take on this thing called communion or the Lord's Supper. Like, what do you call it? Communion or the Lord's Supper? Jesus never said. Jesus didn't name it. Uh, so I guess that's up for grabs. Really, really, it's not a biblical basis. But even this, when do you take it? Because some churches, some churches do it, you know, every Sunday. Some churches is, is part of their liturgy every Sunday. Other churches do it like once a month. Uh, some churches do it like once a quarter. It's baked into their bylaws for some reason. Okay, so when's the biblical reason? Okay, we're finally in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at the Apostle Paul says, describing this on the screen right now. He says, for as, as often as you eat this bread and drink it. He doesn't say when. There's no biblical schedule. He didn't say, by the way, make sure you do this once every three weeks. He doesn't say, it's as often as you do it. So guess what? It's an issue of preference. So we probably won't do it as often because I think it's important, especially early on, I, I pump the brakes and explain biblically what it means. Because yeah, a ritual, thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. Good feedback, son. Thank you. A uh, boy will help me out here. If we just go through a ritual without meaning, it has no power. But you marry the meaning the meaning, with the symbolism, with the substance, is very powerful. Like I did a wedding last week. I don't do a lot of weddings at this point in my career. And I literally stopped and explained the vows. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. They're 1 Corinthians 13. They're unconditional love. So let's, let's talk about what it means. So what's, what's it mean? There's no timetable given it in the Bible. Uh, as often as you do this, uh, drink this cup, you proclaim. Say the word proclaim. One, two, three. Proclaim the Lord's death. Okay, so we, what we do know, the purpose is a proclamation of the cross. Everything Jesus did, I would argue, he's pointing people to the cross. So again, here's another question. What was he thinking? What was he thinking? Okay, what's it mean when he said, this is my body, this is my blood? There are many Christians, literally millions of Christians around the world said what well, Jesus was being literal. Stay with me. A lot of churches believe that the elements are transformed uh, from, from bread and from, from grape juice or wine into the body and blood of Jesus, at least spiritually speaking. Uh, this doctrine is called transformation. And they believe that when you ingest the Lord's Supper in the right spirit, uh, those elements are transformed into grace or forgiveness or the substance of salvation. And by the way, I see where they get that from. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And I love typically a literal interpretation of the text. But I would respectfully say I, I would disagree. I think Jesus is using a metaphor. Jesus loved metaphors. Je Jesus was such a brilliantly creative teacher. Even right there, even the Lord's Supper, think about it, he's using all five senses. They're hearing him speak. They're seeing what he's doing with their eyes. They're tasting. They smell. It's tactile. They touch. Brilliant. But I think it's a metaphor. When he says, this is my body and this is my blood, it's, it's a parable. The same way when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. What did Jesus do for a living? What was his occupation? 
carpenter. Oh, was he lying? He just said he's a shepherd. He wasn't a shepherd. He's a carpenter. No, no. Metaphor, metaphor. He's a pastor. He's shepherding. He's loving. He's kind. He leads us. How about this? He said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Who thinks Jesus was a bush? Anybody? No, no. He's not being. Uh, I am the bread of life. John said, I'm the bread of life. Oh, my gosh. I'm gluten free. I can't do this yet. No, no. That's not what he means. They're all symbols. So, again, context, 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 context. The Passover Seder is already steeped in symbolism. Everything from the time of Moses, the book of Exodus, everything you ate, everything you touched had symbolism. It evolved until the time of Jesus. Jesus takes an already special and sacred symbolic meal and adds a new level of symbolism on top of that. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think it's symbolic. So when you drink it, it'll be Welch's, right? When you drink it, it, I don't think it gets transformed in the blood of Jesus. I think if you do this without understanding or the right heart, it matters nothing. You're just having snack time in church. <laughs> By the way, even the name Lord's Supper. If you heard we're having Lord's Supper and you go, well, let's get breakfast. We're having supper. Mm, you're going to be so disappointed. It's more like the Lord's snack, actually. There's not much to it. What matters is we understand what it represents. He's pointing the 12. He's pointing us to the importance of the cross. The cross. Let me break it down for you really quick. So he, he said two things. He said, this is my body, referring to the bread. This the bread. What's the bread mean? When Jesus said, this is my body, uh, well, you know, he's, he's pointing the fact his body is going to be broken. His body is going to be beaten his body's going to suffer at Calvary in a few hours again. Some theologians say maybe this idea that the bread is his body represents his humanity. You see, he's fully God. He's fully man. And, and the reason I think that's an apt illustration is that bread is common. It is needful, needful but unspecial. Like bread in the ancient world where starvation was really a problem, uh, great leaders like uh, the pharaohs of Egypt and the emperors of Rome knew if they provided bread at little or no cost to the masses, the people would stay content. So bread was the common food of common people. And that's why some theologians think, well, it points to Jesus' humanity because there was nothing special about Jesus' appearance. He didn't grow up in a, in a celebrity family. He didn't grow up in a, in a wealthy family. His parents were working class people. In fact, I'll show you in Christmas, Luke chapter 2, probably at best lower middle class. So if you live next door to Mary and Joseph and Jesus and the rest of the kids in Nazareth, you wouldn't think there's anything special about him. It says in Isaiah that he was not handsome. I hate to break it down. I know when you think of Jesus, see a picture, he's always got a nice looking ripped brother. The Bible says not ordinary, common, common food, a common savior who can relate to common people. The only place I think the bread thing breaks down for me is there's nothing that has less taste than a communion wafer. You never had one or whether it's a cracker or a little piece of matzo or whatever, there is like zero flavor. And I, I want to apologize. If you thought, no, see, back in the Passover, they take the bread and they would dip it in something that had herbs and spices. But today we don't do that. You just get the little like dry, flavorless wafer. Jesus is not flavorless. Jesus has not come to take away the flavor from your, your life. Man. He, he wants to add abundance to your life. So it kind of breaks down. You see, the wafer is bland. The bread is bland. Jesus ain't brand, uh, bland. He brings power and joy and abundance to your life. You know, in fact, Jesus isn't bland. Sometimes Jesus was spicy. Think with me. WWJD, be careful. Sometimes Jesus made a whip and turned over tables. And said things to the bad guys like, you are whitewashed tombs full of decaying corpses and dead men's bones. That's what Jesus did. Now, don't you do that. You're not Jesus. But Jesus was spicy. He was kind. But don't men say kindness for weakness. In fact, as I try to lead the church right now, I love kindness. I think kindness is a superpower. I think leaders, no matter what you're setting is, corporate world, athletics, if you lead with fairness and kindness, it'll take you further. It takes more time. But again, kindness is not being a doormat. So as I lead you all, I'm kind and occasionally spicy. In fact, if you don't know me, I, I, I am known. I try to be kind. It's a biblical thing. By the way, mean Christians, cut it out. The Bible commands us to be kind. It's a fruit of the Spirit along with self-control, right? So we need to be practicing kindness. But guess what? I'm kind, but I'm stubborn. What am I stubborn? Kingdom. Great commission. The cross of our king. I kind of locked down on things like that. Be prepared. 
Jesus was kind. He was spicy. The bread reflects his humanity, his, his commonness. He related to common people. Then the cup, the cup. He said this represents the blood of a new covenant. His blood's unique. Though he looked common, he looked ordinary, he looked middle class, he's of royal blood. And this is cool. To fulfill prophecy, Jesus had to be a direct descendant of what king? Anybody know what king? What king? David. King David. He's the best biblical king outside of King Jesus, but Messiah had to be a direct descendant of King Jesus. Now, when you read the Bible, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, I want to warn you, you'll get to a gene genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 3. If you're new to the Bible, just skip it. Fast forward on your phone, you can skip that. You can blame it on your pastor. Guess what? But if you love the Word of God, sometimes read the genealogies. Actually, the Christmas story is baked into Luke chapter 3. you got to look for it. But why would God include genealogies in the Bible that's so dull? Okay, well, the Messiah has to be from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of King David. Now, the Jews were meticulous in the first century about record keeping, especially their ancestry, their genealogy. I mean, they started Ancestry.com 2,000 years ago. And so every Jew could document their lineage. But when the Romans decimated Israel, raised the wall, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple for over 2,000 years now. They also destroyed every single record of the Jews' genealogy. There's only one Jew, living or dead, who can prove he's a descendant of Abraham and Jacob and, and, and David, Jesus, twice in the Bible. The blood speaks of his royalty, his divinity, that God protected him. He's exactly who the Bible says. He's your Savior. He's the Messiah, fully God, fully man. So the disciples didn't know that Jesus was about to go to the garden and about to go into the hands of sinners, about to be arrested and about to be beaten and about to walk up the Via Della Rosa, and about to hang on the cross for hours, paying for the sin, but we know the whole story. So as we do this, we do it with knowledge. It should have substance. So... What should we do to prepare ourselves for taking the Lord's Supper? Well, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians that we should probably pause and examine ourselves. Don't spend all your time fixating on yourself. Every once in a while is a spiritual discipline to stop and pray a prayer. God, is there anything in my life? Is there any attitude, any habit, maybe a lack of discipline? Is there something in my life that's hindering my growth? And to confess that to God. I love 1 John 1, 9. If you've not memorized scripture, here's like one of the top 10. It says on the screen right now, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I thought, David, I'm forgiven when I was saved. Yes, yes, you were. But this confession is not about your relationship with God. It's about your fellowship with God. It's about letting God know, hey, God, I acknowledge this thing in my life is wrong. And God knows already. I've been one time in my life I confessed a sin to God and God said, wow, I did not see that one. David, wow, thank you for letting me know, not one time. But my acknowledgement that I violated God's will for my life brings me back into alignment and I walk in grace and forgiveness. So when you walked in the room, you received a little piece of paper and a small little pencil or maybe a pen. If you take that out right now, and I want to just give you a little spiritual challenge to take a uh, sin inventory in your life. Now here are the rules. Don't look at anyone else's page. Right, I know you want to lean over and say, honey, you, you missed that one right there. What does that mean? Do not do that. This is personal. In fact, if you want to write in code, you write in code. And by the way, if you see someone writing code, you're not allowed to ask them, what was that? It's not your business. It's between this person and God. If you need some right now, thank you. I see some of the ushers coming from the back. Just raise your hand. And if you've lost yours, I lose stuff in church all the time. I get it. Don't feel bad at all. We'll, we'll hook you up. Why don't you take a moment right now in a spirit of prayer and just say, Father God, where am I falling short? Where am I missing out on your best? Where's an area of my life, Father, that I've, I've violated your word? I want the cleansing and forgiveness that comes by way of confession. So you'll take a moment and write that down. If anybody needs additional paper, we don't judge. Let us know. And then before we take communion, You'll see around the room in the four corners, there are four wooden crosses. They're not fancy, but they're there to serve a purpose. In a moment, we're gonna to start to worship together. Listen to the kind of steps here. During that worship, if you want to, there's hammers and nails. And if you're not good with a hammer and nail, that's fine. We got people that can help you. 
And I want you to nail your little sin inventory to the cross. And by the way, it's just a symbol. There's nothing special about these crosses. We're making a statement, Lord, your cross was because I blow it, because I'm selfish, because I'm sinful. But I'm running to your cross right now. I'm, I'm embracing your grace right now. And so as we worship, you're going to hear the hammering of nails all around the room. It's a way to be reminded what this is all about today. So I want you to do in just a moment, we're going to worship. You'll stand, go to a cross. I'll take a moment, kind of pick your spot, then come back to your seat. Now, at the stations, there are little like single serving communion cups. Take that back to your seat. And then we'll all in a moment, we're all seated again. We'll enjoy communion or Lord's Supper together. Y'all got the steps? So take it back to your seat. Then we'll all do it together in unity. Say the word together. Together. So if you want to, hammer, come back, wait, and then we'll enjoy communion together. It'll take a couple minutes. So Father God, right now we do come and we're so grateful for everything Jesus you did. And yes, the disciples were unclear. They were planning on their thrones and their coronations, not knowing your agenda was a cross. Father, we understand. We thank you. We confess our sin right now in Jesus' name. Amen. As we worship together. nothing you know mystical or magical about a hammer and nails but it's a great symbol to remind us right. I find in my life I do something physically sometimes it solidifies a thought I need to be focused on so again the cost of forgiveness was great he went to that cross why because he loves you and he loves me he paid the price of our sin it's been atoned it's taken care of and we confess that now so fellowship is complete as the last few folks continue to hammer, go ahead and find. Anybody still need one? Anybody need a communion cup? Got it. Oh, coming forward. I'm looking. Hands, 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 hands. Oh. Bill, did you lose your, Bill, did you lose your cup? Oh, Bill. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so it's kind of a one, uh, one-shot thing. Open from the bottom, I believe. There's a little wafer in there. It has no flavor, like I promised. But the scripture says that uh, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he blessed it. And he gave it out. Again, a symbol of his body, his humanity. And said, this bread represents my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you. We remember your suffering. Remember your agony, your pain. You could have written the salvation story in the stars. Instead, you paid the price. Lord, thank you so much. We are grateful. Then if you open the cup from the top, it says after they ate, they drank from a single cup. He said, this cup represents a new covenant, a new agreement, if you will, between God and men of my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we remember, and we're so grateful. We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. And so the purpose, the purpose.
purpose of this is to unify his disciples and that we proclaim his cross to the world. The city needs to hear the message we have. Amen. As your pastor, I want to thank you for the great job you're doing in inviting what God is doing. It's, it's rare. It's, this is not normal. In fact, uh, raise your hand if you're over the age of 30. Don't embarrass anybody. Over there. Okay, that's, that's, that's a bunch of us. We weren't invited here last night. It's so rude. We were not invited by Casty, you know, Quincy, Portia, Charlie, and the team. But they had rally the young adult service in this room last night. And what I saw blew my mind. I want to close the service by show you what God is doing in our church, what God is doing in our city. This is the video of what it looked like in this room 12 hours ago. The hall downstairs was packed, and the balcony, which doesn't have great eye lines, was full as well. With young people, that generation, praising God, the Lord is moving our city, folks. We've been given something so precious to steward. So unity is our battle cry, the cross of our King to our city. Father God, we love you. We pray. If someone's in this room right now and they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, their prayer partners will come to the edge of the stage right now. Give them just the courage to come and say, I need this relationship with a God so personal and so passionate. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. As the church says, together in unity. Amen. Don't miss next week. Dr. Hawkins next week. Love you. Have a great week.